Hi, everybody. I apologize for not being there in person. When this conference came up, my family already had some plans to be on vacation. So when we're done here, I'm headed to the beach. <laughs> Sorry. Now I know you're out there. Good. Okay. So, so this is a topic area. Again, I'm Andrea, and I am with Minnesota Extension. And I work in all kinds of environmental and conservation related issues. Um, but before I worked for Extension, I worked for a nonprofit organization that specialized in teaching about the gray wolf. It's still a very controversial issue. And so our organization took great pains to figure out how to get um, this issue into people's heads without being confrontational, how to be objective and fair to the issue, to many parties on the issue. And we were able to develop some good relationships with a lot of different stakeholders and so through that experience i really developed some concepts some approaches for how to when in a teaching situation how to handle it when issues get hot when things are tough when issues are controversial and so so that's what this session is about and so well, now i'm going to advance but now it won't advance all of a sudden so what's that about oh of course it does that we're right in the middle of so I'm going to stop sharing and start sharing again. Sorry, I'm going to do that. I'm here. For some reason, something witty happened, and that's always how it goes, isn't it? Okay, so how to know an issue is controversial? How would we define it? Um, sometimes an issue becomes controversial when there are competing values and interests. Someone stands to gain and lose as a result of however the issue is resolved. Sometimes an issue is controversial because we just don't know very much. In the early days of the issue of climate change, we just didn't know a lot about what was happening, what was causing it to happen, and what we should do about it. A lot of issues are controversial because they're just so complicated. Again, climate is very much in that case, but a lot of the issues we face are complex, multi-sector issues, and so it's hard to come to any one resolution that satisfies all those sectors. An issue is often controversial when people just disagree about what is true and what is the right action to take. And in many cases, an issue is controversial because there just is no easy solution. There is nothing that will make everyone happy. Sometimes these issues are referred to as intractable or wicked issues. I love that must be an East Coast term, wicked, but I think that's what issues. So issues are difficult, they're complicated, they're often emotional. Uh, but we, especially when in an education setting, we really have to face them. You know, our society needs people to be informed about the controversies, about the difficult things we face, so that they can participate in the in a democratic society. That's how democracies run. When participants are, they know what's going on, and they they care about the answers. And people, of course, can make better decisions about how to participate effectively in that public process when they can wrap their heads around the issue. And any public decision on any issue really does apply both the factual science-based information and also rightfully incorporates people's values, their societal values, and how we want our world to be. You know, scientific information does play an important role here, but it can't really substitute for value choices. And, and sometimes we think that value should stay out of public decisions, but of course, that's part of it. It's part of how who we are as a society. And commonly, public decisions, you know, first began with identity. Somebody raises some sort of problem, and then all kinds of, you know, the media gets involved, people's fears get involved, facts, myths, and values get mixed all mushed together, and somehow a political process happens and a public decision is made. And as educators, our role really has to do with helping to define the problem, helping people understand where the problem lies and what factors are to contribute to that problem, but then also to enlarge the body of facts and reduce the body of myths. Uh, as educators, perhaps that's the most important task we have, is help people understand where the facts are and where they aren't. And that's how educators can contribute to the, the public decision. A lot of times, though, we assume that the reason people don't agree is because they don't understand the issue. And if only they understood, of course, they would see my view and agree with me, because of course I'm right on the issue. And so the you know, logical extension of this is that if you educate someone or you give them information that they'll under, they'll you know agree.
agree with you. And of course, this is how a lot of the advocacy organizations operate. They'll, you know, selectively choose the information to incorporate and, and call that education. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But of course, you know, this maybe sounds a lot like your seventh grade communication speech class information, you know, sender, receiver, done. But really, communication is not that one, two, three. It's a complex, intersecting network of ideas, information, and values. And that's, that's where we're going today. How people feel about an issue um, becomes very important. So again, back to seventh grade here. You might remember the whole idea of the sender sends a message to a receiver and ideally, in a perfect world, our opinions or our biases would run along as a separate issue. They would, um, you know, the message would include some sort of common set of truths, facts, information that's unequivocally true, and then we could introduce our biases or interpretations of that information as a whole separate entity, like an accessory that comes along with the message, clearly and distinctly separate. Unfortunately, what commonly happens is that the bias often mixes it in with the empirical information and that obscures the information altogether so that the facts are indistinguishable from that bias message. These, fact end up, or the, these factors end up distorting what is truth until there's nothing left but the suspicion and distrust. When you think about the media today, it's hard to know what to trust, what media outlets are coloring the message or giving you the straight up what happened. And again, a lot of advocacy groups will will mush together their opinions on the issue so that it's hard to know whether to trust them and their take on the issue. So the distinction between what is fact and what is opinion is often clouded by our personal predispositions for or against an issue. It's not enough to know that people have different opinions. We all understand that, but to really get down to somebody's you know, true viewpoints, understanding those viewpoints, we have to go deeper to understand the underlying roots to those views. You know, like in my case, wolf issues were never just about wolves. Environmental issues are never just about the environment. These issues are about larger differences between us as thinking, feeling humans, and we all assume that our truth is in fact the truth. The thing that is matters to me matters, and that we sometimes can assume we know what other people think or assume that our word is the last word or even to assume we agree uh, these you know these approaches are normal they're human um, having a bias having a predisposition for or against something is normal uh, that is part of the deal of being human and having values um, but their biases do start getting in the way of communication when these biases turns into uh, you know expectations about the truth knowledge. So let's talk a little bit more about this. This is often what we'll see when, when an issue is controversial. Sometimes a group, group an agency, or organization will, you know, choose people, cherry pick what information, what data, what empirical evidence supports their viewpoint and only introduce that time. They may create false dichotomies. And boy, in the crunchy granola environmental world, I see this all the time. It's us against them. It's environmentalists against livestock owners. It's really exaggerating those stereotypes. Which, again, that's, of course, that's not fair. A lot of times, people will use really inflammatory language. And again, trying to build up people's emotions on an issue. And they'll just, again, they'll be very sure that they're right on the issue and they won't have interest in hearing anyone else's opinion and they'll stay in their own silo. And again, that's, that's a bias. That's a way of having a bias. But where do these biases come from? A lot of times they come from fear. They have fear that there is a threat to their worldview, a threat that they might be wrong, a threat that those contradictory viewpoints will challenge their way of being, their income, whatever it may be. A lot of times bias is introduced intentionally with strategy. I experienced that again in my experience in the wolf world. People, advocacy groups intentionally um, misleading the public in order to advocate for their viewpoint and in fact even raise money. And sometimes people will have bias on an issue because they just don't know any different. They didn't realize 
what the situation was for another party to the issue. Uh, they don't really realize how their issue affects other people. So knowing that we all have these opinions, we all have these biases, what, what are we supposed to do with that? As educators, how do we handle that? that my, this is my bias, my view of education is that our job as educators is not to tell people what to think, but to help them think for themselves. That's, this is my favorite quote. Education is not the filling up the pail, not just telling people stuff, but the lighting a candle, inspiring people to think about it for, for themselves. Because controversies can be a great educational tool. It helps people, you know, see that this theoretical, even potentially esoteric topic, this is real. It affects them today. It is right here in front of us. It helps people recognize the emotional connection they may have to the issue in front of them. And so a controversial issue can be very motivating, can get people's blood moving on an issue. And that's good. That's what we want. We want thinkers. We want people to engage with these issues and really think them over. And so, when preparing to teach about a controversial issue, it's helpful to think it through for yourself and analyze the issue so that you understand the perspectives and the issues. And again, you may think that you're quite fully informed of the issues about which you know you deal on a daily professional basis, but here are some tips that I have for how to think about an issue. The first thing to do is to really understand and respect that you have personal opinions on this issue. Understand what those views are, where they came from, so that you can stand secure so that if someone does kind of get in your face or a hot moment happens when it's their people are, you know, fighting even, that you don't have to feel defensive. You can stand secure. My opinions are what they are. They're over here. No one's threatening me. I don't have to take it personally. And if you kind of have that thought process about yourself, then you can move on to teaching about it. It's also helpful to take a look at what do people actually agree on? Where is, is there not controversy on this issue? You know, things like I want to help the environment. I think we all want, you know, clean water, you know, those kinds of things. How to get there and whose fault it is for one thing or the other might be the point of disagreement. What is it exactly that people are disagreeing on? Um, and I like to phrase these disagreements in the form of a question. Because the point is that different people answer that question differently and thus we have a controversy. And so to frame as the issue as a question is really valuable because then that presumes that no one has the answer. We're all working on this question together. And again, the point is that different answers that people may have occur because people have different value systems. They think differently about the big societal questions facing us. Things like, you know, what is nature for? You know, when I think about um, the wolf issue or even things like, you know, logging in the spotted owl or um, clean water or those kinds of things. You know, what is nature for? How, what is government supposed to do here? How much government is too much? How much government is too little? You know, how many wolves are too much or too little? How much logging is enough or too too little? Um, well, how do we decide as a society what's fair? Who has power and who doesn't have power? And maybe who ought to have power? We have different answers to these questions, and as a result of this, this is why we disagree on the specific examples, like things like you know, clean water, endangered species big natural resource use of all kinds. And the point here for me is, is important is that whenever possible as educators, it's best to allow people the freedom to answer these questions for themselves. It's not our place to answer these questions for people. What government should do or shouldn't do. We can tell them what it is. What is the current law? How is that typically interpreted? How does public policy typically play out? Those are, the, or those are the things we can help people understand so that they can see how this larger question comes to play in this local or even national issue, but the specific example of answers to these kinds of questions. And really, many times, all competing those stakeholders need is just permission to have their own answers. People don't want to be trampled. They don't want to be criticized for their worldview, and that's a legitimate thing. We don't get to criticize people for the value system that they hold dear. And so again, our job is to teach the questions. When teaching about a controversial issue,
issue, help people see there are questions, and these questions are bigger than we sometimes realize. A new area of exploration that I found really helpful is thinking about the different ways of knowing. Philosophers have described a variety of ways of knowing. Uh, that's the field of epistemology, right? So this is one model that describes different ways of knowing. Uh, for some people, they know and believe something is true as a result of communication about it. This is reflects how language and word choice influences us, how culture influences language. Uh, trustworthy source told you it's true, and so thus you know it. For others, logic is an important way of knowing, applying the laws of reasoning, if A, then B, that kind of thing. For others, sensory perception is the only way that they truly know something, if they can touch it or feel it. And I would also say that empirical research falls under the category of sensory perception, um, because again, empirical research is based on things that are measurable, observable, quantifiable often. Many people know something to true as, true as a result of emotion, their intuition, or their ethics, their sense of justice, what they you know feel is right in the world. And so people are entitled to trust the way of knowing that works that makes sense for them, that comes to them through their culture or their training. And again, it's not for us to say that one way of knowing is right or wrong. And so, you know, again, each of us has a way that feels right to us. And and again, that's valid. And just because someone comes to a viewpoint on an issue based on a way of knowing that's different from ours doesn't make them wrong. It makes our ways of knowing different. And we may come to different conclusions as a result of those different ways of knowing. This is my other favorite quote about education and issues. Is that we as humans don't really see the world as it is. We don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. We understand the world through the only lens we have, which is our world, our worldview, our personal experience, our training, who we are as humans. So what am I supposed to do with that as an educator? Well, here's, again, here's some things from me um, that have helped me as I've worked through these things. Importantly is to clarify your role. What is my job here? Am I an educator? Am I an advisor? That's a really important distinction. And in the world of extension, and I know not everyone in the group may be with extension, but in extension, we are often called on to be educators and often called on to be advisors. And it's important to distinguish what you're doing at any given time. Because there's a power differential here. When you're an educator, there is a designated learner who constructs new knowledge of their own. Um, they the educator typically has greater knowledge than the other party, and so that again creates a little bit of a power differential. As an advisor, also that role may include some education, but also is often persuasive. Uh, they measure an issue with their own judgments. So many advisors try to get people to agree with them to see the validity of what they're recommending or suggesting, and that becomes advocacy. That's no longer education. And again. It's appropriate sometimes to be an advisor, but don't pretend that the education and advising are the same because that's really not true. And the way a listener listens to those distinctions becomes really important. Another important task is be objective. Be as objective as humanly possible. Again, biases are natural. We talked about that a minute ago. But work towards objectivity because that will gain you integrity. If you are earnest about that endeavor of exploring what is right, what is true, what is important, you will gain integrity. So being objective can be really hard. It requires clarity, clarity of your own thinking, clarity of your own opinions, as I mentioned before. It requires some pretty good self-understanding. It also requires, as I say, clarity. I also mean transparency. When you have a bias, when you have something that is uh, limiting variable for you, you have to at least reveal it. Tell people you know, that you are, you're leaning towards such a suicide for this reason, and then people trust you more. Being objective also requires a pretty diligent effort at separating facts and opinion. It's okay, even as an educator, 
to occasionally offer an opinion as long as it's distinct from the facts. So when we did the wolf thing, we talked about there are, you know, five thousands of wolves in the lower 48 states. Fact. We could talk then or invite multiple opinions. That's too many. That's enough. That's a good amount. You know, whatever it might be. Facts and opinions, not the same thing. This seems obvious to us, but really in our society today, what qualifies as fact and opinion uh, is a lot blurrier. Mm -hmm. Probably the most important task, the most important way to be objective is to have some humility. To realize that you are limited by your worldview, that everybody around us is just one voice, is just one worldview, and we're all entitled to that worldview. It's really hard to transcend that bias, to get past it, and to be really objective, but to respect that we all get to have our truths. And my truth is no more valid than your truth. And your truth doesn't trample on my truth. Again, I think this is something that in our society today really gets lost. All right, another task to do here, something to help be objective, to help address an issue, is to reframe the issue. When you're talking about issues, you can help people understand, again, what are those questions that we're facing as a society, and change it away from stakeholder view A, stakeholder view B, stakeholder view C. It's not really about that. Again, it's about these larger questions we have as a society so that we can all be thinking about the, the big picture understanding and helping people respect and have empathy for those other worldviews, for those other ways of knowing then we can get down to collaborating once we have respect and we're listening to each other's worldviews. All right, how are we doing on time? I'm all set of time. So I have a couple examples of reframing. I'm going to skip a little bit here. In Minnesota, we have a new uh, buffer rule about you know the amount of green space that has to occur in between a row of crops and a waterway. And so a lot of the parties were framing it as you know the farmers will lose money. And the crunchy granola environmentalists were saying we gotta love the earth. And so really as an educator trying to reframe that and talk about it's not about either one of those viewpoints. No one is wrong, therefore no one is more right than anyone else. This is about clean water. This is about our future. How do we want to do that together? And what are we all willing to pay to make that happen? And so just not letting an issue be run by the stakeholders, by those narrow subsets of the viewpoint, but keep taking it back to that bigger level. This is about who we are. This is about how we answer questions about what is nature for and what is the role of government, those kinds of things. That can be really hard to do, and so as educators, we have to insist that people listen to each other and have civil behavior with each other to insist on a, an environment where we can actually discuss things with honesty and integrity so that deliberation can occur towards a healthy democratic decision. Because of course, you know, I'm from Minnesota, so it's pretty common for people to be polite and rude, you know, be respectful and orderly. But keep in mind that all of these things we've been talking about, the assumptions, the beliefs, the world views, that will all be underlying all of those discussions and you know, public meetings and all of that kind of stuff that happens. So, all right, we can talk more about civility later, but I want to give time for questions here. So, remembering, as educators, the, a very important task is to help people recognize the difference between facts and opinion. Distinguish when bias is occurring, where it kind of colors our statements, and then separate opinions from facts. Again, that seems really simple. But, you know, be fair with the facts. Don't cherry pick them, all of that. Respect other people's ways of knowing and help others respect all the different kinds of ways of knowing. We don't get to tell anyone that their values, their worldview, or their way of knowing is wrong. Also, clarifying your role. Again, being careful to, to, to sort of clarify in any given moment, whether you're being an educator or an advisor, and when you're applying judgment or simply presenting facts. Again, even educators are welcome to allow for there to be opinions or to put proportion on an issue. It's not necessary, you know, I'm not saying pretend that we don't know, you know, that climate is in fact changing. We can't have a for and against, I'm not suggesting that. We also have to put proportion on an issue, saying like, why this proportion of the evidence tells us this, there are some people this, but, you know, together we know this from 
evidence, and therefore the questions we're facing today are those, you know, that kind of thing. Reframing issues, uh, please always help people understand those big questions we as a society face. And then insist on civility. When we can handle these controversies with integrity, handle them, be honest, be earnest in our exploration of how we should move forward together, this is where credibility lies. People don't always expect that educators to have an answer, but they do expect an educator to be fair and honest. And so working diligently towards addressing those controversies fairly, objectively, builds one's own credibility, the credibility of your organization, and gains you the integrity uh, that will help you listen to you again in the future. There's a great uh, publication on this issue. If you Google this topic, you might not come up because it's kind of been buried in the internet land. And so, um, Jenny, you, we can talk about how I can send the link to this PDF uh, to everyone if they're interested. And we can talk about that later. But this is written by Extension folks for Extension, respecting the multiple different hats that Extension educators may wear uh, in any given effort. All right, so I'd be happy to take questions. I've got all day. Um, are there questions?